Well, hello everyone and welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, Change with Ted Williams and some election coverage tonight. I don't know how you guys are feeling or what's going on with you tonight, uh, but I can tell you we are really living through some history changing and history making events. And I think we should be talking about them. And I think we should be um, kind of, you know, engaging and thinking about them and trying to figure out ways that we as citizens can uh, really live out, you know, our calling to be involved in the political process uh, and that sort of thing. And so uh, good evening. Happy Tuesday night to everyone. I hope you guys are all doing well. And I hope that uh, in many ways that you are uh, living your best life here in 2021 already. We're only five days in, folks. Can you believe it? 2020 is only five days in. What's up, Ken Thomas? How are you? Yes, we are running in the blue right now. We're going to be talking about this. I'm bringing on a political science professor, friend of mine, and we've got some good conversations about a couple different topics. So first of all, I was, gonna, I was planning on talking about Georgia tonight, right? Because that's what's happening. But then we still want to talk about what... Our uh, favorite reality star president is doing uh, around this election. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and last but not least, unfortunately, you all, we have now seen that in the Jacob Blake case that there have been um, that the police have 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 no charges. There have been there's no accountability in the Jacob Blake case. And I just want to know what you guys think about that. Hit me in the comment section. Let me know. You know, are, are you? Uh, I mean, are you going out to protest? Are you are you upset? Of course, obviously, most people are upset about this. Um, well, maybe not most people, but <laughs> I think most people who are committed to justice are upset about this in some way, shape, or form. I want to talk about those three things tonight. And so I'm going to bring on a friend of mine, Professor Mac Z. Zorowski, who is a political science professor at Chicago State University. And we're going to bring her on in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I just want to kind of connect, man, and, and say, listen, I mean, I don't know about you and how you feel but I am um, uh, invigorated in many ways of what's happening in Georgia. I am um, angered in many ways by what the president is doing and his request for over 11,000 votes. You know, I had someone say, you know, the other day, I was like, you know, I, I saw this and someone goes, yeah, well, what if I went to the bank and said, hey, you know, I'm missing $11,000. You guys misplaced $11,000. I want you to go find that $11,000 for me, right? I thought that was crazy and, and, and uh, tragic and hilarious all at the same time. But then I also thought about the fact that the Republicans who who are cl uh, claiming that this election has been stolen, right? Uh, are many of the same people who are in office and who kind of use those same ballots, they use the same uh, election process, and they did not necessarily complain about their own votes, right? They did not complain necessarily. I mean, if the system is broken, right, and the election was stolen, then wouldn't all the elections, all the races, all the way down the ballot be tainted and be problematic and the system be broken? But it's crazy because many of these people are not complaining about their own races, they're only complaining about the president's race, which I I think is problematic in many ways. And then the other thing is, you know, what's going to happen to President Trump after this, right? What's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to Trumpism? You know, I get the chance to do, you know, commentary in some different spaces. And uh, one of the things I do, I, I go on this radio show periodically. And uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about this group called the Lincoln Project, right? And the Lincoln Project is this group of folks who were kind of Lincoln Republicans, who kind of Republicans who are anti-Trump, who are saying, hey, we believe in the Republican Party, we don't believe in him. What's going to happen to them after this uh, the president leaves office? What's going to happen to the Republican Party? What's going to happen to the Democratic Party? And what's going to happen to our lives? And let me tell you all this, okay? I tell people all the time, hey, politics impacts your life, whether you care about it not and you got to hear me on this ladies and gentlemen i cannot give you a more clear example than the stimulus checks that many people just received this past week i mean if you think about that alone right whether a democrat is in office or republicans in office a uh progressive is in office uh someone who's not progressive is in office whether the, the senate or the house are controlled by a different party that directly impacts the amount of money in your bank account isn't that crazy if you never thought that politics impacted you before, it impacts you now. If you never thought that politics impacted you before, the fact that 300,000 people have died, 300,000 people in this country have died, and we are living in national shutdowns. Uh, L.A. is suffering heavily right now, guys, heavily. These things are direct results of political leadership. And many people go, oh, well, the president, well, he, could, you know, he couldn't do anything about this. 
the president could not create or stop the virus. That is true. But the United States has not, I would say arguably, but not really arguably, has had the worst response to the virus in the world because we have the most cases in the world, right? And if you look at what has happened since March and February, um, you know, February-ish, March, right, March, April, we have really had an administration that has governed under the state's rights philosophy, and that state's rights philosophy has really left us high and dry, folks. And I've argued for years that, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes, and there are no libertarians in times of crises. And so we need the federal government to do something, right? We need the federal government to be engaged and involved in times of crises, and we cannot go, oh, we have a major pandemic. However, we're going to leave everything up to the states. That is not leadership, ladies and gentlemen. That is not governing. Now, I don't know what your ideological bend is and what you think about the political process and all those other things. For me, it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that the federal government has the unique authority, power, and ability to do things that no other uh, system in the country or in the world can do. They can move faster. They can get resources to people quickly. And those are the things, ladies and gentlemen, that the federal government is uniquely qualified to do in America constitutionally. And so when we abdicate that responsibility, people die. When we abdicate that responsibility, people suffer unnecessarily. When we abdicate that responsibility, you have 50 different responses to the greatest global pandemic that we've experienced really in 100 years in this country. So we can, this is not the time for states' rights and states' philosophy. And I don't listen. And honestly, you know what, guys? I mean, I used to try to be all nonpartisan at various times and stuff. I'm over that because people are dying, right? Lives are at stake. So if you don't like, I, listen, I believe right now, I don't think the Democrats are perfect in any way. I don't think the Democrats are, you know, the savior of the world. But I'm telling you right here, right now, in this moment, it is literally like uh, uh, life and death in between the two parties right now. You have, unfortunately, one party right now that is fighting mask mandates, that is fighting stay-at-home orders, that is fighting um, to give less money rather than more money to people who are suffering. And you don't mean to tell me that that we should not be uh, politically aligned or or part partisan or speak out about this are we crazy right i'm not saying that the republicans are wrong and everything because they're not but what i am saying that in this moment leadership is needed and the philosophy that says that states should have full authority and it's every man for himself this real darwinian notion of political of the political process is uh killing folks and that's really what's happening. So we're going to talk about this. So welcome, guys. Happy Tuesday night. I hope you all are doing well. Hit me up in the comments section. I'm on fire tonight. I'm excited. I am uh, uh, really happy. What's up, Johnny? You're back. Good to see you, man. What's up, Ken Thomas? out from California, all the way out there. Let me know if you're with, listening or watching. Uh, we got a great, great guest that's going to come on. But I have to give you guys a little rant because I got a lot to say, right? And I hope that you all are encouraged. I will tell you the one thing that, you know, America is uh, really, it's a dichotomy in many ways. On one hand, we get excited because America is a land of hope and dreams and promises and that sort of thing. And on the other hand, we see, man, again, another person, right? Jacob Blake, another person killed by the police, another person who does not have health care, another person does who does not, you know, have uh, adequate housing. And so, really, guys, you need to be mature as you think about this. In America, really, two realities can exist at the same time. America's not all bad or all good. And we have to be able to, you know, Mark Twain said that it was a sign of a mature person to be able to have two competing ideas in your head at the same time. If you are able to understand that, we have to recognize that America has some good things. There's beauty in some parts of capitalism in this country. And there's beauty in the diversity that exists in this country. And those things are good and they're real. There are more millionaires in America than any other country in the world. That is true. However, at the same time, at the same time, we have a political system that does not call corporations to pay their fair share. We have a political system, and I, I shared about this a couple days ago, the corporations in the 1950s paid 6% of all federal revenues, excuse me, paid over 30% of all federal, federal revenues, now they pay 6%. And so what I'm saying is, is that you have to have responsible capitalism. We have to have responsible freedom. And freedom cannot be idolized, because when freedom is idolized, it will destroy us. And guess who said that, folks? 
I just made that up, okay? So that's 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 a new quote for tonight. I guess it's a Ted Williams quote. You know, I can't remember the quote. I'm going to tell it to you again. I'm going to have to go back and listen to the replay and figure this out. So we're going to talk about Georgia tonight, guys. We're talking about Jacob Blake tonight, guys. We're talking about the president tonight. And I'm going to bring on my friend, Max Zizorowski, so I can stop ranting. And y'all can hear from her, too. But then when she goes, I'm going to start ranting some more because I just got so much that's on my heart right now. And I just want us to be engaged and um, encouraged and, um, you know, just aware that our voices matter, right? Voting matters. I sat down with my kids tonight and I told them about the Georgia race. And I said, kids, this is how politics impacts you. My, my two daughters, uh, my son wasn't there, but my two daughters who are 14 and 12, they're like, well, Daddy, why does this matter? I said, because if the Senate is won these two seats, it'll be a tie 50-50. And I asked them how many people in the Senate, they knew that, and da-da-da-da. And I asked them about the vice president breaking the tie, and they knew who the vice president was, other things like that. And then I said to them, that's how it matters, and how will that affect us directly? Well, it affects so many ways. I'm going to let Matt... Talk, Max, you talk about this as well, but it affects us in so many ways. It affects student loans. It affects the Paris Climate Agreement. It affects, you know, uh, pandemic relief. It affects uh, not only the, it affects the rollout of the virus, right? All of these things are impacted. And so, okay, I'm worked up. Johnny, I see you. I'm hoping things become uh, interesting in Georgia. What are you hoping for, Mr. Williams? Well, I will tell you, I hope. I mean, I hope that the Democrats win, guys. I, I do. I mean, I just, I just do, right? Um, right now, they are up. Uh, 41% of the votes are in. Ossoff is up 55% uh, to produce 44%. Uh, and uh, Reverend War Warnock, who uh, I'm really excited about him, guys. Uh, he's up 55% to 44%. And the reason I'm so excited about him, for a lot of reasons. Number one... You know, I'm a I'm a real uh, I teach political science, and I I really uh, have thought a lot about you know African Americans in the Senate and all of the kind of stuff, and I've uh, written about them. And and do you realize, guys, that for a period of time, and I brag about Chicago for a period of time, the only African American senators in the United States Senate were from the South Side of Chicago for a period of about 15 years, actually closer to 20 years, which I think is pretty cool. You had Roland Burris, you had uh, Carol Mosley Braun, you had Barack Obama, and so we are a unique space and place. And right now, we have anybody know how many African American senators in the, are in the U.S. Senate right now. Put in the chat box if you know, if you know, if you know. I'll give you five, four, three. Come on. Two. Come on. Give me one answer. Somebody give me an answer. How many African American senators are in the U.S. Senate right now? Five, four, three. I lost my numbers. Three, two, and a one. Okay, right now we have two. We just lost one. Uh, Kamala Harris just left. Uh, and we have Tim Scott and Cory Booker who are in. And so uh, Raphael Warnick would represent uh, progress in that way, right? Um, Hiram Rebels was the first African American U.S. senator who, by the way, was a preacher also. So anyone who says that um, that the idea that this preacher can't be in the U.S. Senate is a fool because Hiram Rebels, the first African-American senator, was uh, was a preacher himself. Right. Who was elected in during Reconstruction in the 1870s. And so that is an exciting thing. But guys, I'm going to tell you, in the U.S. Senate has never been representative of the, of the population. Never. Right. Even if we get Warnock and it'll be three and the African-American population is, is 13, uh, 13 percent. The Latino population is 15 percent. And as far as I can recall, I think there is one or two Latino uh, senators. So please correct me if I'm wrong. I think women and Maxine may have been able to answer this question. I know women are not 50 percent of the Senate. I think they may be somewhere about a quarter, if that. Right. Actually, not even a quarter, guys. They're probably less than a dozen female senators. But I might have Maxine correct me on that because I've not checked that one out. But what I'm saying is, is that this represents progress. It represents progress from the faith tip as well. I love his sort of connection of spirituality uh, and uh, the Bible and progressive politics. I think really just the heart of kind of trying to help poor people. I think that's really amazing. And last but not least, he's got a personal connection. I got a good buddy, uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Griffin, Reverend Daryl Griffin over at Oakdale Covenant here on 95th Street in Chicago. That's those, those are boys. That's his, his, his a spoon coom. And so we've got that connection there. So Reverend Warnock, maybe you'll come and, uh, you know, and do something at Oakdale sometime and we'll all get to you know support him but this is monumental guys and then obviously what happens with oh, Bi with Biden oh Biden <laughs> I think Obama did that one time he called him oh Biden what happened what happens with Bi Biden's agenda he does not exist for four years if they lose the Senate and so this is really really critical okay anyway all right Max Z come on in let's see all right everybody this is my buddy Max Z Zorowski Max Z is a professor of political science Chicago State University uh, and she is a writer, and she does a political blog, and I want you to tell us about your blog. But before we do that, uh, well, actually, yes, I want you to introduce yourself, 
Tell us about your blog, right? And the wonderful work that you're doing. But then I also want you to tell the audience, how do you feel about this race in Georgia right now? What do you think is happening? What do you think is going to happen? I would love to get your uh, comments and thoughts on that. So you and I were speaking before we went live and the race is not just about the Senate and about us being able to have laws passed that will benefit us for the next four years, not four years. Never think that a law benefits us for four years. We're talking about a generation, right? It's, it's very difficult to repeal a law. And so if we have laws for the DACA students and for COVID relief, and if we have um, uh, student loan relief, which of course we're all looking for, then that's going to last for generations. It's not just for us. But one thing that we didn't talk about that I think that this election is the most important is that this is a referendum on Jim Crow. We haven't talked about that. No one has brought up that you have all of these Southern states finally going blue. And as these states finally go blue, their inner laws will begin to change because you have powerful people at the top of the pyramid now. So you'll have, I mean, we still have laws that are in some of these states, Georgia, Alabama, uh, the Carolinas, that are on the books from the 1800s, which are still destroying the lives of African Americans. And I, I really believe that we haven't, no one's really discussed, that's one of the most important to me. This, so first, it's being able to pass laws. Secondly, the referendum on Jim Crow. And third is, this is King's legacy. This is something that King started. 70 years ago, almost 80 years ago, because remember his father was a part of Ebenezer Church. So the same place that Warnock's coming from. So we finally have King's legacy coming through in the 21st century. It gives me chills to even talk about it, right? It's amazing that this man's work from a hunt from 70 years ago is finally coming through to save our lives today. And it's not just about African-Americans. King didn't just save African-Americans. I have equal rights because of him, because he included me, right? And so that is one of those. So those are my three top most important. Mac, I got I to gotta stop but, you. I got I to stop you right there, Mac. Y'all listen, I want to get up and get excited. You know, in, in the uh, African-American church community, people get up and run around and stuff like that. And I want to get up and run around and... Because what you just said gave me chills. It gave me chills. Of course, I, you know, I have not, I, 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 so I say this to my shame. I should have put two and two together. I knew that obviously he came out of Dr. King's church, but I really did not really think about how he is really a continuation of Dr. King's legacy. And it's funny because I have this painting sitting right here. I have this, this uh, thing. I'm going to show you guys real quick. So I'm going to pull you out for a second so you can see this real quick. Okay, I'm going to pull you back in. But you guys, look at this. So this is like uh, my grandmother gave me this right it's a uh um it is a representation of you know dr king's legacy and how it's connected to obama right okay and it's funny because i guess you guys get the point you can see it so it's funny because i've had that uh in my house for a long time and i never put it up and i never put it up and here's why i never and please forgive me if you like got all different pillars I never felt that Barack Obama was a continuation of Dr. King's legacy. Now, I love Barack Obama. I think Barack Obama is a great guy. But I and I and I and I voted for him twice, and and I worked on his campaign at one point when he ran for Senate. But I never saw that connection for a lot of reasons. There were a lot of reasons there that I did not see, like Dr. King's dream, and then Obama was a was a manifestation of that. But Raphael Warnock may be right. Because he comes from the same ideological, philosophical, theological perspective. And he is as progressive as Dr. King was. People don't realize how radical Dr. King was. Dr. King was not just, I have a dream. Dr. King uh, talked about the Vietnam War. I mean, many of you believe that Dr. King was killed because of his progressive politics. You know, when he died, he was in Memphis to support the sanitation workers and union rights, which is a huge, huge issue, right? So, so those are big deals. And so I just, no disrespect to Obama. I love Obama. 
but I just always was like, I, I wanted to make a stronger, you know, because I teach politics, I'm into theology and, you know, I, I know, church ministry and all this stuff. So I think about these things at a deeper level. And so I really was like, man, I feel like I'm going to get a post of a Warnock on there. I'll put a bomb on there too, but I got to put Warnock on there as well because I, I think that, that that's the manifestation. So you said this is a referendum on Jim Crow, right? This is a referendum on Jim Crow. Now, the South in uh, Georgia particularly has not gone blue since 92, right? Since we had a... Um, a presidential candidate that said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss, L Miss Lewinsky. He, remember that guy? Uh huh. That was my buddy, man. I, I loved Clinton back in the day. I was, I was, you know, in high school when he ran. And I remember watching him play the saxophone on Arsenio Hall. And I was all excited. And I remember he said that he would get uh, free college for every student that wanted to do it through the National Service Act. I remember all those promises. So I was in high school, about, you know, going into college and excited. So, so when you look at it, he was the last Democrat to get to have the state of Georgia blue and now it, uh, Biden just won Georgia and then you know and then now we may have two senators in Georgia and Georgia's flipping and the south is changing so why don't you talk to me about that and then I want you to tie in wh what's happening with the with the, the presidential election still, which should be over, right? I mean, because <laughs> it should be over. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about Jacob Blake. And then, honestly, guys, I just forgot about this. We got to talk about Chicago public schools and other public schools who are going back. We we got. I hope you got a few minutes with Maxi because we got, we got some stuff to talk about. I mean, the world is like, there's a lot of stuff happening. And for those of us who teach politics for a living, uh, there could not be more, more a more exciting time. So why don't you talk to us a little about what's happening with President Trump and the challenges to uh, the election election results in Georgia and other states. What Trump did earlier this week, uh, yesterday, I don't know, there's so much that has happened. So when he called the Georgia governor or uh, when he called up Georgia and said that he wanted 11,000 votes, right? He needed a little more than 11,000 votes. That's against the law. Unfortunately, because he's a president and normally, under normal circumstances, you would not arrest a U.S. president. But if this is an abnormal president, he's done abnormal things and been very blatant about breaking the law. I don't see where we are allowing him to get away with this. So on January 22nd, life might change in America where we can need, we need to start changing laws that state that um, the president is not allowed to break laws within his presidency and that he has immunity. We cannot continue that. Not after the people have elected somebody like Trump. You can't keep immunity. You just can't. Yeah, I would say um, what will probably happen, I think, you know, and I'll just hop on this for a second. I think what will probably happen is the federal government is not going to go after him. Uh, Biden's not going to go after him. Attorney General's not going to go after him. But I do think just, uh, uh, Letitia James in New York, um, I think that state's attorney in New York has got something for President Trump. And uh, I'm not wishing it, hoping it, but I do think that there needs to be accountability. And this is what you and I talked about before the show started. There has to be accountability. If there's no accountability in the government, then what is the point, right? If you can, and we'll talk about Jacob Blake shortly, but I'm going to let you finish on, on Bush, or on Bush, on Trump. Bush didn't do anything. I don't want to throw Bush in there. Poor Bush. Bush is like, Bush is like, what do I got to do with this? You didn't do anything, Bush. I just threw your name in there accidentally. But if there's no accountability in that, and there's no accountability in the Jacob Blake case, right, that a police officer can shoot someone seven times who's unarmed, then what kind of country do we live in? So why don't you talk about, uh, continue about Trump, and then if you want to, you know, go from there, you can. One of the issues that I have with this election is that you and I had spoken before about how this is a re ref uh, referendum on Trump. Re uh, Trump has stumped really hard in the state. Uh, Pence came out in this state. We're talking all the way to last night that they were coming out to this state because they understand the long-term generational changes that can happen if we take the Senate. What beyond just us taking the Senate is we're going, we can, as an American country, put in Warnock, who is a black leader from King's Legacy. So all of these people that came out and voted this very conservative um, agenda, again, would never want King's Legacy because King, King's Legacy first is about love. Secondly, it's about equality. Third, it's about um, progress. But anyway, so this is about a referendum, just not just on Trump, but it's it's about how he lost. This is a man who refuses to accept a loss because he's been able to buy everything his whole life, and this time he's just going to have to take it. This was a, a it's also a rallying cry to people to come out to make sure they vote. 
about it. Uh, it's it, just before six o'clock when uh, Georgia bo polls closed, Ossoff was going out and doing line warming, telling people you can stay in line, stay in line to vote. And some of these places are going to be open until 2 a.m. tonight, right? Where, were, where was Trump at those line warmings, right? He comes out, he tells a bunch of lies, he says what he's gonna say, and then the next thing you know, he's he's gone. He's just he's just advertising himself. That, that's who he's always been, right? So as much as we'd like to say maybe it's a referendum on Trump, it's also, he was the last rallying cry for these Republicans. He really was. You know, it's funny you say that because, you know, I am, um... I consider myself a bit of a Trump scholar now, right? I think I've memorized all these Trumpian quotes since 2015, which is so funny because I was ending my own race in 2015. So I ran for uh, city council in 2015. And I was thinking, I was like, man, that's like a whole lifetime ago. And I was like, that was the beginning of Trumpism. And so I slid from my own race to sort of watching this guy and studying him. But if you remember back in 2016, in 2016, he said very clearly, they asked him if he would accept the results of the election in 2016 and he said before the race happened he said i will accept the results and he thought made this big joke he goes he goes i'll accept the results if i win <laughs> and everyone starts cheering and, like that. and i was like you know what you know maya angelou says that uh when someone shows you who they are you should believe them right president trump told you four years ago that he would only accept election results that he, if he won. So this, there should be no question, right, about what's happening here. There should be no question that 60 lawsuits have been thrown out, that the Supreme Court has denied even taking on these cases twice. The Supreme Court that's heavily conservative, right? There should be no surprise that this is happening. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you know, what I am concerned about, is that we have, you know, uh, literally it said something like uh, 40 to 50 percent of Republicans believe that he won the race. Uh, what I'm concerned about mostly is how do we go forward as a nation with this really divided space? We're seeing two different worlds, right? And and whether once again you're progressive or you're conservative, uh, you know, we can have different opinions, but not different facts. And so, how do we go forward? What do you think is going to happen in the future? Will there be another Trump? Uh, in the next race, a, a, a more uh, polished Trump. What do you think is going to happen in our political process um, after uh, this presidential transition? I just have to mention one more thing about Trump. So I was watching something called The Men Who Built America. It was a History Channel special. It's from several years ago, I think over 10 years ago. And in it, you know what Trump says? Of course, if you're smart, you buy when the economy is bad. You buy up everything you can. That's when I buy everything up. Check out America right now. Where's the COVID vaccine? Where where has been any kind of relief? Why why provide relief when you can buy everything up right now? So this is a man who just can't get over himself. That's it. We're done. I was done. I've been done with this. I almost stopped watching the news for almost four years and I teach. So you can imagine I'm sitting there trying to look at all these different articles from all over the place. I do believe that we will have more men who believe their demigods run for election. I do believe that the Republican Party, if you looked at the Republican Party this past um, this past election and the past couple cycles, actually, they've had less and less women running. That's a sign right there. When you ask earlier, there, it is 25 women in the Senate. But there's less and less women running. So you have these um, very rich males who have an extremely wide network of money going to be able to consistently run people and never forget that one politician creates a 30 year span of their legacy so for every person that you elect you have to figure his inner circle is going to want to run right because now they have all the connections they know exactly what to do they're going, and then they're going to groom someone. Yes, I'm going to use a very ugly word because that's exactly what they're doing. They're going to groom someone else for that next election, next election. So we might have this for 30 years. We might have people like him that are close to him who are going to use some of the very similar tactics as him in politics. And then you have to understand too, the Southern United States is different than anywhere else in the world. It is extremely conservative. It's extremely poor. I don't think anybody wants to talk about the immense poverty there, right? When you have a lot of people that are poor, 
who have a false sense of superiority, of course, someone's going to consistently try to rise up and say, oh, no, I can lead. I can lead. We're going to have a lot more Huey Longs. I really do believe that. So I think we're stuck with Trump and his people for at least 30 more years. I don't think we'll have another president. Though. I think we've learned our lesson, at least for this generation, especially with the immense amount of voters that came out with Gen Z and um, the millennials. And then you had a lot more. Um, did you see the sign, Ted? I just have to say this. There's a sign that's on 35th and King, and it says, America, you're welcome. And it says, Black women. I mean, these women are never going to stop. They're finally getting um, recognition for their immense amount of work. I mean, these are the women who ran SNCC back in the 60s, back in the 50s, and nobody thought about them. So I think that the Democrats are going to stay very strong for a very long time. Most of the conservatives are getting very old now, too. We don't Thank have a. Mm. No, thank you so much for that. I, 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 uh, I really, really appreciate your perspective, although it uh, is a bit disheartening, right? And I, I, I knew this. I mean, I knew this. I studied this as well. And, you know, I'd like to sort of live uh, perpetually in the audacity of hope, as Barack Obama uh, referred to it. And uh, obviously, Reverend Wright uh, coined the phrase uh, at Trinity. But um, I would love to live in that space. But I know in reality, there's going to be many more Trumps. And they'll be more slick, and they'll know how to talk better, but they'll have the same agenda, they'll have the same, um, many of the same tactics, um, and it's really going to be, really in many ways, a sort of a dying, sort of last gasp of a country that is monolithic and homogenous. And I tell people all the time, I, I do these kind of panels and stuff a lot, and I was talking to someone the other day, and I said, you know, I would hope that people, even in those rural communities, and I've got a comment I'm going to read uh, in a second, but uh, even in those rural communities and places like that, they would not be threatened by the progress of all people. That when there's equality and that more folks get ahead in this country, then we'd all do better. And the idea of a zero-sum game that, you know, if this person gets something, I can't have anything, to me that is, it's terrifying, it's stupid, um, and it is going to ultimately destroy our country. We are only as strong as our weakest link. I say this Dr. King quote all the time, you cannot have a first-class country, a first-class nation with second-class citizens. And so we are better if the nation's more inclusive. We are better if the nation allows sort of more kids to have quality education rather than less and more folks to have health care rather than less. That's all this is about. And so it breaks my heart that there are folks who, and I've watched and listened enough to all sides of the aisle where I hear people arguing, oh, look at Chicago, it's so bad, I hate driving through there, it's, you know, the Democrats destroyed this, da, da, da. Chicago's an American city. Detroit's an American city. New Orleans is an American city. When the president gets on television and, and blasts these cities and blasts Baltimore, what you're saying is, is that you have abdicated your responsibility for millions of people in your own country. That's what you're saying. But it whips people up and they go, oh yeah, well you can blame. No, these cities are a reflection of generations of national, federal, and local policies. And when you think critically for a moment, you understand that it's not because, oh, a Democrat has been in the mayor's uh, seat for da-da-da, Chicago has a poverty issue. No, it's because there has been redlining and there have been generations of um, poorly funded schools where the state of Illinois uh, ranked 48th out of 50 in terms of income inequality around schools and based on our property tax system, all those things. And so it just makes me angry that we have people in this country that are so selfish that they are willing to allow the entire country to fall apart for the sake of their own prosperity. And that, Maxi, angers me to no end, but I'm encouraged by what's happening right now. Uh, my friend Lori Harris, who is a political scholar in her own right, an activist and former candidate down in Florida, thanks for watching, Lori, and who's actually been on the show as well, uh, says the South has been read, as you have said, Ted, that rhymes, by the way, she's a poet, she didn't know that, but the South has been read, as you have said, Ted, since Clinton, 
but it also is black. Stacey Abrams mobilized, organized um, uh, black and indigenous people of color uh, like no one has ever through uh, finding their common thread of our communities wanting a voice in self-determination. Uh, why don't you respond to that? And then before you do that, I want to say just a quick update. Warnock is at 52.7% with 52% of the vote in. And also, um, let's see, Ossoff is at 52.3% or 52% of the vote in. And of course, what does that really mean, right? It's like when Trump goes, hey, I was winning uh, at, at midnight. How come I didn't win the race? It's like a football game. You can't take the score in the third quarter. So anyway, why don't you talk about that? And then we're going to talk about Jacob Blake uh, in a second. If you want to respond to her comment, uh, and then we'll talk about Jacob Blake in a second. So the comment was, is that the South is red and that it's mostly African-American, right? I think what's going to change, there's something called demographic inversion. I read a whole book on it. It's very interesting, and it's happening in Chicago. One of the issues, I work in Inglewood uh, three times a week. So one of the issues that's occurring in Inglewood, that's occurring in this entire country, besides this um, adherence to a false sense of white superiority, and that's how Trump got into office, is... Um, the dispersion of people from cities to counties now, right? So you have, if you, if we just take Inglewood for instance, okay? So in Inglewood, there are blocks and blocks where there are not any houses. Then some of the houses that you'll see on those blocks are completely decayed, falling apart, literally falling, leaning. I'm, I'm calling buildings and calling everybody to get these buildings together all the time. Why do you think they've allowed that to happen? Why would you, why would you, as a Congress, send money to Chicago to help the South Side revitalize if you know they're all black voters? And if you have 50% of Republicans who are mostly just helping out their own counties, then of course you're not going to want to send the money to Chicago. So something is occurring now. It's called demographic inversion, where you're starting to see white people move into Inglewood. You're starting to see white people and they're not just like your average white people like me, like your middle class person. These are upper middle class and upper class white people buying up all the property. And so if you know as an investment person or as a politician that you're attracting them to your neighborhood, then why are you going to spend money on, on that neighborhood when you know they're going to take care of it eventually? Right. I mean, and then the lack of density in these neighborhoods, if you don't have anybody to go to, a store, if not enough people live in a store, you can't build a new store because there's not enough people to maintain it by spending money there. And that's one of the things that we're seeing. We're seeing a reverse in the uh, demographic. We're seeing a reversal of demographics in the South. Yes, it is mostly African-American, right? But you're seeing them leave. So at one time, they all went to the cities, right, as part of the Great Migration. Even though they didn't migrate to Milwaukee and Chicago and Philly and things like that, they went into the cities because that's where the majority of the work was going to be if you didn't want to be a sharecropper. Now you're seeing them start to disperse because you have more um, opportunities to do online work. You have more opportunities, uh, express ways. There's uh, uh, faster trained uh, metras, things like that. So now you're starting to see these counties starting to build out that are becoming more African-American, not just African-American. Look at Gwinnett County in Georgia, one of the most diverse counties in all of America. There are more languages spoken there in just that one county than there are in any county in the United States. So you have people starting to migrate outside of the cities who are finally going to start to, what I'm gonna call it, infiltrate the politics there to start turning more places blue and to finally start creating more of a legacy of progress outside of just cities where we accept all. Um, what was oh. the other thing we want to talk about? No, I actually, I'll get, I'll hop into the next part, but that was excellent. Very well said. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, you see why I have these wonderful uh, scholars that come on and uh, help us to understand these things from a real um, contextual space place right so that we're not just you know one thing that frustrates me when i talk about politics with people or society is that oftentimes if we don't stop to think we look at everything through the lens of our own experiences right and our own experiences are limited so people literally go well uh it's not that hard to make it in america because i made it okay uh they go well there's not really racism because i didn't experience it uh well there's not police brutality because nobody shot me 
I mean, these are like literally the conversations I have. And guys, honestly, that is nuts if you think about it. And what we must understand is, is that our experiences are, are our reality, but they may not be everyone else's reality. And I talk about this on a personal level. You know, I grew up in a very middle class home. I didn't, I never been really harassed by the police. You know, um, I went to school and, and got an education and blah, 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 and you know, whatever. But that's me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm one person. And I'm from a family that has done that as well, but it does not negate, as my favorite artist says, Paul Robeson, said that his individual success, if you don't know about Paul Robeson, everybody, go look him up. Great, great, great hero in American history. But he said that his individual success as an artist, and he was an entertainer and other things, did not negate the suffering of, at that time, 30 million people of color. And that is where we have to, even if, you know, no matter what ethnicity you're from, you have to recognize that it's not about you, right? It is about how do we have a society that's better. And that's the mask issue, right? As we're going through, oh, I want to wear a mask. Okay, it's not about you, right? We talk about whatever we're talking about. So I want to switch uh, topics for a second. And I want to talk about, because uh, this just popped up, right? And I was not um, planning on talking about this tonight when we scheduled this. Uh, and then this sort of just happened. So as you know, Jacob Blake was shot seven times uh, in the back by a police officer. Um, I believe that, that they said in the court case that only four bullets hit, but I, I could be wrong. Um, but I believe only four bullets hit. Um, but as you know, uh, Jacob Blake uh, was breaking up a fight for uh, these two women. Um, his uh, it was a domestic call from the police. His uh, I think his girlfriend called the police. Uh, he comes on the scene and then he's breaking up a fight or whatever. Uh, and uh, the police say that they thought that he was trying to kidnap one of the kids in the car, which is why they shot him. But um, I am telling you, here we are again. You know, Breonna Taylor uh, had had a situation where. Um, the people who killed her, they did not get any charges, right? Um, you know, and you've seen case after case where the charges, even if they have come, they've been very minimal at best. So what do you think um, about this case? And what do you think is going to happen? Um, I know right now that, you know, Kenosha has got the National Guard deployed. Uh, people are upset because when there is no justice, there is no peace. And people are upset about this. What do you think about the uh, Jacob Blake case? Now, this is a case that we're going to tie into Georgia, okay, because we need national legislation to demilitarize the police and to how, how hold them accountable. We have no accountability laws for any of these police officers, right? We all saw how that police officer shot that man. We all watched it on TV. There was no reason for him to start shooting. And if he was going to kidnap the child, why would you put bullets in the car, right? There's no accountability. We need national legislation. We can no longer uh, accept or allow local municipalities and local police officers and departments to decide what the law is. There has to be one law, one law to follow for everyone. Because when we start to change laws, just like how we, how how it comes back to Congress, right? If we have a majority of Democrats in the Senate and in the House. We can possibly pass the national legislation to demilitarize the police and to enforce that there is no more shootings, um, that there has to be, um, there was, there's an organization, it's, it, they work with Black Lives Matter, they're a legal organization, and they have, I think there's like 120 questions that you have to be able to answer to say that you should have pulled your firearm. Why doesn't that ever happen? But going back to voting, if we continue, if we don't continue to vote people in who are going to pass legislation for checks and balances, right? There's no checks and balances on these police officers. And what a lot of people don't understand is black people have done us an amazing favor by having the Black Lives Matter movement because more white people have died by police officers' guns than anybody ever talks about, but we don't ever talk about it. White people never mention that. And Hispanics, too, about five years ago, there were over almost 300 Hispanics who had been killed by police officers. And no one's talking about it. Black Lives Matter is doing this for America, just not about black people. Sure, it says Black Lives Matter, but it really is for all of us, just like King, King's legacy again. Right. And so if we don't. We have to have accountability laws. We have to have a questionnaire. We have to have 
something that states that when you cannot pull your firearm on these people, that guy got into a car. Hmm. Go ahead, Ted. Go ahead, Ted. Um, yeah, so, um, I actually, no, I was going to let you go. I might have accidentally muted myself, but it's okay. Um, thank you. I mean, yes, yes, and yes. I, I could not agree with you more uh, on what you're talking about here. Um, you know, for me, you know, it really is, it's a racial issue, but it's bigger than that. It is an issue of the question of accountability and authority with, the, with, with our government. And whether the government has the right to take life. And it's funny to me because the very people who are the patriots who argue that, you know, the government should not be telling them to wear a mask or, or taking life or doing these things, right, should be advocating for the police to be held accountable when they exercise this lethal authority. What, viola what greater violation of your rights can you have than someone taking your life? There's no other way the government can impose. There's no greater way the government can impose on you than, than taking your life. And let me say this clearly. I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that when you're in that life or death situation, even as a police officer, that you might not make a mistake and you might not have a challenge and you might not go through a situation. I get that. And I want that to be very clear as we talk about this. That's reality because we're dealing with human beings. However, many of the cases that we're talking about are egregious. They're not, oh my goodness, he came to me and I, I shot one time and you know what I'm saying? These are not, when you shoot Laquan McDonald 16 times and he's running away from you. When you put your knee on George Floyd's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. When you shoot Jacob Blake in the back 7 times. Or you shoot at him 7 times, hit him 4 times. When you walk into Breonna Taylor's home and you kill her in her sleep. You know, these are not these are not sort of the kinds of cases that we could look at and say maybe, right? Maybe, just maybe. Um, these are cases where, and, 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 and look, I'll, I'll admit as well, maybe people weren't complying, right? It's the always, oh, maybe you weren't complying, you weren't complying. The police are not given, and I want this to be very clear to people, they are not given the authority to be judge, jury, and executioner in the streets. Even if you're not complying. They're still not given that authority, and that, that's wrong. And my friend Keith Townsend hopped on the line, and he goes, immigrants make it. I think we were talking a few minutes ago about uh, who makes it and that sort of thing. Uh, and so I'm not sure what he means by that, but I'm going to kind of take that a little bit. I think he may mean that uh, people can come to the country and make it if they just work hard, that sort of thing. I think that's where he's going. And correct me if I'm wrong, Keith. But I would suggest that... Um, we are comparing in many ways apples and oranges, right? When we talk about immigrants coming in and making it in America, um, you can go through a long, long um, history, historic look at what immigrant groups have done well, what they have done well in, the challenges that have been faced by certain communities legally, legislatively, and, and otherwise. Okay, it's, it's what Keith constantly hears. Um, I, I would say that, uh, Keith, thank you. You know, he says he, he's, he's what he constantly hears, that, that, that immigrants make it. Um, I think that the story is, is, is a much deeper than that. And I think that when you look at immigrant communities, primarily those who are coming to the states are, I hate to say this, but they're the cream of the crop. Many people who are coming to open businesses or to go to school or do whatever, these are folks who are fleeing bad conditions, coming to America, and they are sort of as a W.E.B. Dubois would say, the talented tenth, if you will, right? Um, you, you look at this, uh, this question of sort of comparing, right, how come people of color who have been in this country, you know, African Americans 400 years, how come they can't make it like immigrants make it? I make the argument very clearly that there are so many more institutional barriers and so many more um, um, uh, governmental cultural challenges that are faced by groups in this nation that you really cannot compare uh, the two groups in that way. Um, I do believe that, um, you know, and I, I'm a firm believer that anybody can make it in this country, but if we don't take responsibility for communities that we've left behind, America will, will cease to be great someday. So, uh, Mac, you want to hop in on that one? 
I believe exactly what you're saying. If we don't start to help these communities, they're just going to continue to crumble until someone else comes and takes them. And take is what they're doing. How can your house that you bought in 1965 for $30,000 on 59th of May still only be worth $30,000 today? It's systematic destruction of neighborhoods. And this is going back to, so going back to Congress, right? And to touch on Jacob Blake, uh, Blake again. What we need to do is the United, the U.S. Department of Justice needs to step in on Jacob Blake and make sure that our officers are charged with um, discharging a firearm, undue harm, whatever they want, whatever is in their laws. Because like I said, all of them have something different. But every time we have to call the DOJ, we can avoid that if we just have a national law. If we just have one national law that says this is this is the only way you get to shoot somebody, then we would uh, uh, we would be able to bypass that. Another thing that happened today, Ted, that I read um, in uh, Chicago Block Club was police ran over a woman and laid on her leg for eight minutes. Okay. And then um, a couple days ago, they beat somebody up. We're talking about no accountability at all. There are no rules. One of the reasons there are no rules is because they're militarized, right? They're sergeants, lieutenants. We don't and how many people ask who has the ability to go to the military and ask a question? Very rarely you have to go through court martials. You have to have um, someone. So if we're looking at a national perspective, then you have to have somebody from the Joint uh, joint Chiefs of Staff ask what the president has to ask. Or you have to have enough people in Congress to have hearings. And that's the same thing that's happening to us with the police. And that's why these neighborhoods don't get any better. Look at the how many people we've lost in Chicago in the past few years, and it's majority African Americans. They're not safe, and nobody cares that they're not safe. One thing I want to touch on <laughs> that I have to mention is that I'm reading the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. First of all, it should be American required reading, just like uh, the, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. But something that she discusses, and what I believe that's going to happen once we get rid of Trump, right? What I think is coming in the next 10 years, first of all, is a really heavy progressive push for more social legislation, um, more watchdog and accountability is going to come. But another thing is going to be the, the class wars here in America. We're already seeing that because we have such a backlash on unions. And the unions, Amazon unionizing would really help us if they would open up some of their warehouses in places like Inglewood, back of the yards and things like that. And the fact that we aren't getting those companies to open in those kind of areas isn't going to help Chicago or, or Detroit or anyone else. We really need to come back. We have to go full circle. Thank you for that as well. Uh, Keith Towns has said in the in the uh, comments section that a buddy of his is uh, that's a conservative is writing uh, a book on the topic of how immigrants make it. Uh, and honestly, you know that's a beautiful American story. Uh, and uh, you know it is true um, for some communities. But I think it's interesting when you look at history. We are celebrating 2021 or 2021. We're going to celebrate the 100th year anniversary of Black Wall Street and the bombing of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And tell your friend, Keith, that uh, until, if he can find an immigrant community that has experienced the kind of terror uh, that uh, African Americans experienced when they tried to build their own builders, businesses, and communities 100 years ago, and the systemic um, exclusion from every facet of American life uh, overtly for not one generation not a hundred years, but for 400 years. Uh, and we are now in a situation in which the civil rights movement was just 50 years ago, and we're just beginning to unpack. Uh, it's almost like, you know, um, it's almost like if you are, you know, beating someone up and then you stop punching them and they're laying in the middle of a street and they're bloody and bleeding. And the civil rights movement was the, the, the punching like sort of lightening up or, or stopping and maybe not even fully stopping maybe the punching just got a little bit lighter right but even in that way we still go to the hospital 
right? And we still got to get sewn up. And we still got to learn how to walk again and talk again. And all those various things that come after a great injury, I think that is the reality. So I'd love to have a conversation with your buddy, Keith. Maybe I can bring him on the show or something like that. Um, but um, I think that um, it's a, unfortunately a simplistic and false view of the reality of America. And yes, America has been good in many ways. But Isabella Wilkerson's book, which I'm, I know of and I haven't read it, but the, the idea that America is not a place of great social mobility, but that there is a caste system in America, I think every American ought to wrestle with that reality because I know that that's what you're reading about and that this, there are plenty of countries around the world that actually have a greater social mobility uh, uh, greater uh, social mobility in their nations than America does. And so that, to me, I think is, is so critical. Um, so, back to the Senate race real quickly. Uh, it's tightening up, folks. Warnock's at 50.7. Ossoff is at 50.2. 63% of the vote is in. Guys, this race will determine the next four years, and as Max Z said, uh, a generation of public policy. Um, so this is huge. This is huge. Um, I want you to talk about, I'm going to close out in a few minutes. I want to uh, do this in under an hour. So we have, it's at 55 minutes. So I'm going to close us out in about three or four minutes. Cause I, I needed to like say 59 minutes when people want to go back and watch it. It just seemed like an hour. It seems like so long, you know, but maybe for 58 minutes, maybe psychologically people will turn it on later or something like that. So I'm going to kind of get done here in just a couple minutes, but, um, I want to talk about CPS and going back to schools and, and not just CPS. Those, we got people who are watching from all over the country. So, uh, you know, Chicago, public schools right but this going back to school uh we got 40 percent of teachers did not show up to work this week in chicago uh because they are like we're not going back right uh so i want to talk about that in a second in closing and then um keith says i might invite him to talk to you it'll be a fascinating conversation very much the vein the reason we have the problems we do because of, because uh he's very much of the vein that the reason we have the problems we do uh, is because of democratic governing in cities which is ironic as most of the successful black people i know are conservative um, Aaliyah Tucker said, I don't consider people who were kidnapped and brought here to be slaves as immigrants. I think captive is a better word. That's awesome. Very, very good. I hope I didn't say that. Um, but yes, absolutely. I agree with you a thousand percent, Alita. And yes, Keith, I uh, would love to talk about that because um, once again, you know, I mean, I hate to be insulting to your friend, but there's a thing called federalism. And the idea that a Democrat runs a city does not mean that the entire city is reflective of the democratic policy of the city government because there's a state government and there's a federal government and those uh, powers influence what happens in the city. Most of our funding comes from the state government, our federal government, is really uh, connected and distributed at the, the state government. I argue the state government is the most powerful entity uh, in the uh, government process. And so I just hate, you know, I, I mean, I would love to talk to your friend, but can you just tell him, like, I, I'll give him, I hate to be insulting, but I'll give him a political science 101 book and he can look and understand that it's not just what happens in the cities. Can you just start with that conversation? Not to be insulting, but come on, folks, we have to get beyond the blame shifting and we have to understand how this actually works. Keith said I had that conversation with him about being on Twitter, enlightening and frustrating. At the same time, I feel you, Brother Keith. Uh, Maxie, talk to me about mass mandate CPS schools opening or whatever else you want to do. We got about two minutes. Uh, go for it. <laughs> First of all, federalism is my absolute favorite. And if federalism were to work properly, we would be in better shape than we are now. But um, I think CPS schools, one of the reasons that it's really important to open back up is majority minority uh, students. And the majority minority of those students are also low income. We have mothers and fathers that need to go back to work. Who knows where these kids have been? I mean, really, if you have to go to work and you cannot drop them off at schools like you normally do, you're dropping them off to a neighbor, they're staying at home by themselves, and they're not getting the proper... Not all children can learn online if you're not raised like that. Like my son, he goes to school online. He loves it. He absolutely loves it, right? Now, my nephew is struggling with it. Two kids, same kind of family that they grew up in. But they need those resources. Um, they need their free lunches. They need their free breakfast. They need um, supplies. They need attention, too. Let's not forget that some of these kids are coming from a house where there's seven kids. Who's paying attention to them? Not saying anything bad about parents, but if I had seven kids, I wouldn't re remember all their names all the time. I just wouldn't. <laughs> But I think that's one of the most important reasons that we have to go back to schools because it really is a safety net for children. 
Thank you so much, Max Z. We will pick that one up later because I'm sure there are lots of thoughts about that, coupled with the safety of, of teachers and uh, staff and that sort of thing. And how do you deal with that, right? I know, you know, my kids are at home. I know a lot of people who are terrified to send their kids to school right now, uh, even in the midst of this. And so, how do we deal with both, right? Dr. King talked about, you know, how do we deal with the politics of both and not either or? And I think if we can do that in all these issues, we can really make a difference. Guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for participating. Um, go Georgia. Let's see what happens here. I'm excited. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night. And uh, we'll keep on talking and keep on engaging and, and hopefully uh, helping each other to deal with the crazy times we're living in. Take care now. Bye-bye.